Hey everybody, welcome to my top five. This is a top five dedicated to 40 minute filler board games. Now I'm still calling these filler with lots and lots of love, but they are still short board games. Now if, if this game takes 45 minutes or more, it's not on my list. So I've really picked those 40 minute board games that you can still sneak in at the beginning of a night, the end of a night, or in between other games. And if you saw my previous top five, I did 20 minute board games. So this is the, the board game that takes between 30 and 40 minutes to play, but no more than 40. And I hope you like it because there's some really good games here. Jumping right into it, I've got my number five and I am using the collector's edition of this simply because it just adds even more cool things and cool um, elements to the game that is the base game. But I would recommend the base game too. It is... Cartographers! Yeah, Cartographers is a fantastic drawing game. I love that players get to have their own map and these maps vary. In this, you get even more different maps that you can use that just have things in different places so you're not playing the same map every single time. So players are going to essentially see all of these different scoring opportunities at various points in the game, and that means that they will score, let's say, A and B in the first round. Then they're gonna score B and C in the next round, C and D, and then D and A. There are four rounds and you're gonna score every card twice, but at a different point in the game. So you really have to strategize, when are you trying to meet the highest peak of that particular scoring card and make sure you nail it right when the season happens. On a player's turn though, what they're going to do is look at the flipped over terrain card. That, that starts essentially each one of the turns for everybody and it's play is simultaneous. So a player's gonna look at that and see a particular terrain type, and they're going to see a size. And generally there will be choices. Sometimes you're gonna have the card that shows all the different terrain and then one size, or you're gonna have one particular terrain and several different sizes to pick from. And what that means is you will draw that shape into your player board anywhere you want, and you fill it in. Um, this version has colored pencils, and so you can essentially draw in the trees and the water, farm and the villages and monsters and things like that, which is really just the fun part of it. Sometimes you have to wait for players to, you know, get done being creative and artistic. Uh, for me, my sheets don't always look that great. I always feel bad for the players who have to pass me theirs so that I can draw the monsters on it and then pass it back because it just looks so bad. <laughs> but then I get mine and I'm like, oh, this is beautiful. Thank you for, you know, enhancing my ugh, map. So my creative drawing aside, this game is really fun and replayable. And I love the polyomino feel to it as you draw in the shapes, trying to, again, maximize the scoring that you see on the season cards that everybody knows about. And you never know exactly when the end of the round is gonna happen because it's triggered by a particular threshold. And so you might get a whole bunch of cards in, which means you get to draw a whole bunch of shapes. You might actually have some monsters in the round. You might have the ruin symbol show up and have to really, you know, work your, work your magic on what you thought you were going to do and, and kind of change plans. But you never know exactly when that's gonna cross over and you're always like, you know, please, 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 right? Um, well, I need this just now, right, before I score, you know, CD or whatever. I have to be honest, cartographers didn't strike me at the very beginning. It didn't, it didn't necessarily, you know, excite me. And I think I had to just warm to it. And I think I had to really see this as a fun puzzle game. And I think it's pretty cool, though. It made my top five 40-minute board games for a reason. Um, I keep playing it, and the more I play it, the more I like it. All right, moving on to number four. This game is pretty new and I think it's just fantastic. It might be on the um, shorter end, on the 30 minute side, but I, I still think first time games through are gonna play about 40 minutes long. So that's why it's on this list. It is definitely not a 20 minute game. And I think it's just delightful. The theme is there and it goes all the way up to five players, which can be challenging to find a 40 minute board game that plays five. It is? 
Yeah, Whirling Witchcraft. Ah, okay, so Whirling Witchcraft has really captured my household. I like it a lot. This is number four on my top five. I think Lewis might actually make it his number one. He really likes this game. Now, let me tell you what you're doing. You've got a player board. It's kind of like a little pot. So you've got this ingredient stash that you have as a witch. And you are essentially trying to use those ingredients to activate these potion cards that you have. And those allow you to gather a bunch of ingredients that you put on this cauldron and you send to the player to your left. And then they have to put those ingredients in their, um, like, um, what is it, like a, a workbench. And you think, why am I giving cubes to someone else? Why would I want to give them as many as possible? Because you do want to give them as many as possible. Well, you want to overflow their workbench. You want to send them way too many things. And every cube that they're not allowed to place, that they can't actually place in these specific numbered uh, rows, you get back and those are victory points. And any witch who reaches five or exceeds five of those overflow points they gave to the witch to their left, they will trigger the end of the game. And then players are going to count up how many points did you earn by kicking back those overflow ingredients. The other element to this, that's, that's really cool. I mean, that's just so smart. I love that. And in, on top of that, you have a card drafting and the cards go the other way. So you're essentially passing cards to the player to your right, knowing that they might take those cards, use those cards, and send you back ingredients. And so there's a lot of planning, there's a lot of thought that goes into this, but the gameplay is pretty fast. The game lasts, anytime I play it, it's around seven turns, and so you get to play seven cards, that's it. <laughs> you go and you go, card, and then you run everything, and then you do it, and you, you just go. It's, it's fantastic, it's so fun. Um, I don't know, like you, we, we've ended up playing it over and over and over and over and over again, like like three or four games in a row, because it's just delightful. You can play with the base witches that have just one special ability that you get to use once in the game. Those are the initiates. And you can also play with the special witches that give every player an asymmetric ability that allows you to do something really cool. And I like that. I like that you can play a little advanced, but you can also play with the base cards. And I'll tell you, the base cards, when you need that flush, when you need to get rid of the cards in your hand and draw a new hand, you need it. And it's like the most valuable like move in the game. So do not underestimate the initiate and how powerful they are. There's also special bonus chits that trigger when you get them on the even numbers. It's so cool. It's so cool. It's so fun. I like it. I like it. And it is number four on my top five list. Okay, we are at the halfway point. Time for my number three. This is a game that is tile-based. Yes, it is. And the tiles are really lovely. They feel so good. And you are also playing on your own personal board. So there is player interaction and you're vying for all these different pieces, but it's up to you to figure out how you're puzzling out your quilt. It is? Azul! Yeah, it's your patchwork. You're, you're putting together all these tiles and it's beautiful and lovely and just, again, a really streamlined abstract game that I like. I like it a lot and I like the base game. I think the other three absolutely offer the Azul universe and the strategy gamers a little bit more juice, uh, but this is a, a great streamlined 40 minute board game um, that I just keep coming back to. So players are going to look at all these different discs with four choices on each disc of different patterns and colors. What they will do is simply take from one of those discs all of the same kind, and they will play it into their player area into a one, two, three, four, or five spot. And when you finish that um, area on your board, you will essentially be locking that in at the end of the round to move into the five by five grid. And that's how you score, is by moving those tiles over just one of the one, two, three, four, five, and just discarding the rest, and you'll start to score. And you'll score when things become adjacent to each other. And you'll also score when you finish rows and columns, 
And the one rule in this game is that you're never allowed to put the same tile type in one row or one column. Now in the base game, they force you to not make mistakes. I played on the other side that was blank and it allows you to kind of put your stuff where you want to, but then you get yourself in pickles because I can't see <laughs> shapes and colors apparently. <laughs> um, and I kind of got myself in a, in a pickle not being able to put a tile in a particular space because, whoops, I already have one in that particular row or column. However, this is a great game to share with people. It's a great game to start or end the night, and it does take 40 minutes to play. A lovely abstract puzzle game. Wow, we are all ready to my number two. And I think this is a really strong pick, mostly because this game actually topped a lot of people's 2021 um, lists of the year. It's a fantastic tile building um, habitat for animals. You might have guessed it by now. It is... Cascadia! Yeah, Cascadia. I, I like this a lot because you have so much flexibility to just kind of design what you want to in your player area. But the coolest part about it is the open drafting. There are four uh, terrain or habitat tiles that are drawn, and then those are the hexes, and then there are animal discs that are drawn, and one is paired with each. So you have one animal with one habitat. And when it comes to you as a player uh, on your turn, you take one combination. You say, I'd like this animal that's paired with this particular habitat, and you take it, and then you place those into your player area. You place your, your um, tile down, and then you can place your animal anywhere where there's an empty space. And that's it. It's super fast. Players are going to you know, fill that spot back up by drawing one of those habitats and one of those animals. And then players are going to continue around uh, the table, just going clockwise until there's nothing left to take. Now, why are you taking particular habitats and why are you taking animals? In the beginning of the game, you are selecting one animal card scoring for each of the animals in the game. And there are five animals. And each of those animals has, I think, four scoring cards. And so you can pick the scoring card A for the hawks. You can pick scoring card B for the salmon, C for the bears, whatever, the elk. I mean, you've got all these different ways of scoring these animals and the way they behave in the wild, which is really fun. And at the end of the game, you're just going to say, okay, let's score up our salmon. Who did this? I got five points. You got seven points. You got four points. And you just go through every animal and you score up based on the card that you select in the beginning. So you want to put your animals in spaces that they like and your tiles are going to tell you what they like. And then you're also going to score up all of those habitats and you want to make large contiguous groupings of the region because you'll score points for every tile that's in that grouping. And you will also score if you have the biggest at the table. So if I've got 11 tiles of one particular habitat and that beats everyone else, I'm going to receive points for that, uh, which is great. So there's habitat scoring, uh, which is adjacency and contiguous groups. You're going to do animals, which changes every game. And then the heart of it is just that, you know, mechanic where you draw your open drafting, right? You just say, I like this one and I like that one. And you've got these little um, pine cones. <laughs> and these pine cones are kind of like ways for you to kind of modify or change things. And so those give you a little flexibility when it comes to drawing from the bag and, and flushing out the animals and taking different combinations. So you don't always have to take the pairing that's visible. If you pay one of your little um, nature pine cones, you get to take any combination. So there's a lot to like about Cascadia, and it's a fantastic game to introduce to new gamers, but it's also just fun as a, a strategy gamer, just to sit down for 40 minutes and jump into a game of Cascadia. Okay, before we get to my number one, I do have an honorable mention. This is a runner up. I love this game. I love this honorable mention and I couldn't leave it off my list. Now, I will say the reason why it's a runner up and not in my top five is because I think it takes me more than 40 minutes to play. Now, the game lists on the box lid that it's 30 to 45 minutes to play. I have yet to knock out a game of this in 30 minutes. 
If you do, then fantastic, you're playing it right. Maybe there's just a little bit too much analysis paralysis with the people I play with and with me. The game I am talking about and the game that I just absolutely adore is... Yeah, it's Sagrada. I absolutely love Sagrada. I think it's a wonderful game and to, to love a game so much that's, that's absolutely abstract, it's colors, it's configurations and it's dice. It's six-sided pips, that's it. And you just have a stained glass window design and you are simply trying to pl like play out all of your dice based on the pips and the colors in the screen underneath the, um, the, the dual layered cardboard uh, like window that you're painting, that you're, that you're putting together. On their turn, players are going to be taking dice and they just put them into their window, but it's done in a really interesting way. I like it. It's kind of Catan style where you do setup. The first player is going to roll the dice into this little uh, box. They're going to take one that they want, place it into their window, and then players are going to draft a die going around. And then you get to the end player, the last player, they're going to draft a second one in a row and it comes back to the first player. So you get first pick, but you also get last pick. And there's still a choice though, because there's always one die left over to put up in the, um, the, the kind of scoreboard area where it keeps track of how many uh, rounds you've done. That's it. And once you've played your 10 rounds, it's over. There's some fun stuff you're always going for too much and you might just bite off more than you can chew. But I think Sagrada is a lovely game. I love it. I really love it. But it takes me more than 40 minutes to play every single time I've played it. So that's why it just missed my list. All right, time for my number one 40 minute filler board game. So you have to know it's got a dynamite theme and some really cool mechanics that allow players to make a lot of choices. Now, 40 minutes isn't a long time to do it, but this game does it for me and I will play it any day of the week. It is? Kanagawa. I love this game. <laughs> I love it so much. And you did see a Bruno Cavalli game on my 20 minute board games. So here he is again, uh, partnered with Charles Chevalier. And I am just always floored by how much I love this game. So the first cool thing that players get to see is this uh, rolled out mat with face up or face down symbology. And players are going to play out the cards, but just enough for every player on the top row. So that start player is going to flip over cards, either face up or face down based on the amount of players. And they're going to decide first, do I want to take one of these columns? Now, in the very first, you know, play out, there's only one card in the column, then players in turn order can say, I'd like to take that card, which means that they're not going to have two or three cards to take in that column. They're just taking one, but it might be the exact card that you're looking for, for a variety of reasons. So let's say every player passes, then it's going to come back to first player. They're going to take the cards and do the next row, which now means each column has two cards in it, either face up or face down. And they'll do the same thing. First player, would you like to take any of those rows? Yes, then take a row. That row is essentially done. No card's going to go in that bottom spot. And that player is going to add that, uh, those cards to their collection. If you all pass again, everybody's going to get those three cards. But you can see how players can essentially take a card or two and drop out. And that's essentially that kind of auction phase where it goes in turn order. Once players have their cards, they can decide to do one of two things with them. They can paint them, but they can only paint them as long as they have paintbrushes with the right colors down in their studio, which means that a lot of cards are going to be flipped over and placed with the brown side. And this game requires a lot of fanning. And I think sometimes that can be a little fiddly and players don't like it, but you're just simply tucking cards under other cards so that you can see only one side, the side that you chose, which is either a right side or upside down. So players are going to have paintbrushes that they paint their swatches with and cards are going to have seasons on them and you're going to get points for adjacent seasons and the longest contiguous line. You're also vying for these first come first serve bonuses and there is a threshold. Let's say you how many trees you have showing in the painted pictures. If you have three, you can take that very first uh, victory point uh, tile. But if you say, no, 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 I want to get the five one. 
Well, you haven't reached the five yet, and you say pass on it, you can't come back to that three. You can take the next one, or you can take the, the five, but you can't take that three again. So you really want prestige by getting collections of things that are all available. Everyone sees all those victory point bonuses at the beginning of the game. So there's animals, and there's terrain, and there's seasons, and there's colors, and it's just lovely. And I love the opening round drafting. I love it so much. It's so clever and interesting with the face down cards. You don't know exactly what you're going to get, but you see a color and the color indicates what might potentially be underneath it. This game is beautiful. This game is lovely. I got the expansion to it and I think it was one of the very first videos I filmed for this channel. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Don't watch it. It's so old. <laughs> But I love this game. I love the way it makes me feel and I, I just think it's a lovely game. I do. And it's a perfect 40 minute filler board game and that's why it tops my charts. If you haven't checked out Kanagawa, please do. It's a lovely game. Thank you so much for joining me for this top five. I know you've got your favorites. Put them in the comments below. Maybe we have some crossover. Maybe you thought of a great game that you play a lot that is perfect for that 40 minute mark. And let me know if you can play Sagrada in under 45 minutes, because I can't. All right, everybody, I'll see you next time.